Embassy Software, one of the world's leading names in the development of simulation software, is looking towards a new era as it completes its 50 years of inception. We get together for a quick chat with the President and CEO of MSC Software, Dominic Galelo, along with the country manager, Sridhar Dharmarajan. But before that, excerpts from the keynote that Galelo delivered at this year's user conference in Bengaluru. The story of MSC is really the story about pioneering and incredible human spirit. And I think before we go forward with all the presentations uh, going into the future today, I'd like to go back a little bit, and really, the story of MSC is about people, and that's what I want to talk about. Over the last three years, I've had the ability, the, really the honor and pleasure to speak to many of the founders of the company, and the people involved with the company, great men, who really made it happen. And I really kind of put it all together in terms of the characteristics of these people, and maybe we can learn from it. They were all very smart. They had the ability to invent. They had an incredible thirst for knowledge. They were supremely confident to deliver on a completely uncertain future. And they were leaders that always delivered the mission. And that's what MSC is about. And so to take it forward, we should start with where it all began. It began in Huntsville, Alabama with the Saturn V rocket and the space program. And so NASA, to test that rocket, what they had to do was put it in the dynamic test stand building, 113 meters tall, the building. And literally, they shook the rocket. And that was called structural analysis. To take it a little bit further, on the right side, a visionary at NASA, Tom Butler, he had a crazy idea. Why don't we do that test on this new device called a computer? And there was a PhD from Caltech, a mathematician on the right side, Dr. Richard McNeil. He said, I want to win that contract to go get that business from NASA. And you, know, you talk about invention and pioneering. Um, that wasn't a digital computer that Dr. McNeil was sitting next to. It was an analog computer. And unlike all of us, if we want a new computer, we call our IT department. They call the shop, and they deliver one. In those days, you didn't do that. He actually built that analog computer with his own hands. And so there were other great men that I had the, the pleasure to correspond with. One of them in the center is Chris Kraft. Chris was the flight director at NASA. He was a structural engineer. He started calculating loads with a slide rule when he started his career. And he was just really amazing in terms of NASTRAN and its ability and its effect on the space program. Sitting down on the left, um, Gene Kranz, very, very famous guy. Many of us have saw the movie Apollo 13, and there was the, uh, the NASA flight controller who said that failure is not an option. So our company was born around these kinds of guys, that failure was not an option. They could create into an uncertain future. They can do some amazing things. Gentlemen, it's a delight to have you join us here on Bloomberg Television India. And um, Mr. Galelo, Sridhar, welcome to join us here today. Uh, Mr. Galelo, uh, 50 years, to be leading a company when it's 50 years old must be you know, a fantastic place to be in, but also a pretty tough place to be in because you're responsible, of, you know, responsible in steering the company over the next couple of decades. But before we talk about what you have in mind for the next few decades, tell me, what have been the pivotal points over the last few decades that have helped you reach the place here you are today in the scale and the terms of technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it is a delight. A 50-year-old software company, it's amazing. Yeah. But if I think about pivotal points for the company, you have to go back a little bit. And so a pivotal point for the company was when a visionary at NASA said, mm -hmm. instead of taking a Saturn V rocket, mm -hmm. putting it in a building that was 113 meters tall and shaking it, right. let's put it on a computer and try to do the same structural simulation on a computer. Okay. And our company, as a tiny little engineering company, mm -hmm. grabbed the contract. You know, so it fought big competition like Douglas Aircraft and TRW and big giants mm -hmm. like that to win that contract. Okay. And it won the contract. And then the second pivotal point uh -huh. was when the US government in 1971 said mm -hmm. there was something called putting software in the public domain, mm -hmm. meaning like today we call it open source. Yep. In those days, it was public domain. Uh -huh. So we took a copy of the software 
and made our version of that software, which is still, after 40 years, a flagship product of the company. Fantastic. But I would like to believe that over the last 40, 50 years, much has changed because if you're looking at Apollo 11, you hear about you know, all these stories that keep coming about how there was a processor there that ran at 66 megahertz, and today I have a smartphone that runs 20 times as fast. You know, there's a lot that has changed in terms of technology, and I'm sure NASA is doing some fantastic work. But as MSC, how have you seen the landscape of simulation change? Well, it, it's, it's changed dramatically. First of all, computational power mm -hmm. is incredible, yeah. right? In those days, as you said, like an Apollo, you know, 256K mm -hmm. was all the memory that you had in Apollo. And today, we have customers that are running 20,000 core computers. Moore's so, law in action. Uh, so it really is that uh -huh. you can almost get to a much more real-time world of mm -hmm. simulation mm -hmm. because computational power. I think the second thing is the metaphor. Mm -hmm. uh, in the old days, it was really hard, mm -hmm. and today you can make it dramatically easier and more accessible, mm -hmm. not only for the big Boeing and Airbus and BMW and Toyota, mm -hmm. or, you know, or Tata and Ashok, mm -hmm. but also down for the suppliers mm -hmm. who have to provide behavioral models also. But, but having the technology way before everybody else, what have been the inundations in that landscape? What are the ups and downs that you have faced in order to you know, reach the model that you, have, you know, that you have here today? Yeah, you know, I, I think it, um, you know, every company, as you might imagine, in 50 years mm -hmm. goes through ups and downs. Mm -hmm. But I like to always think of the positive side. Okay. And the great upside of our company is when we partner with our customers to create new behaviors. And mm -hmm. when we do that, when we have the kinds of developers and you know, we have very, very smart people um, partnering with our customers for new simulation method, um, then it's all about up. The cost of testing mm -hmm. is exploding, and now with new material systems and products, right. it's absolutely uh, an order of magnitude exploding. And so customers want to simulate as much as possible right. before they ever build anything. So that works in our advantage. To get your hands dirty before you get your hands actually dirty. Exactly. But uh, let's talk more about what, you know, what are the aces that you have up your sleeve? How have you been able to fell off competition globally and in India? Yeah, I, you know, I always like to say it's partnering on the engineering method, mm -hmm. right? Because being a, a product seller, mm -hmm. right, developing some software and selling software, mm -hmm. that makes you almost a commodity. Mm -hmm. But when you have, I, I would say one of the things that I personally do, mm -hmm. I have engineering management meetings every six months yep. with the major auto the major aerospace companies in the world, mm -hmm. and myself and my management team, mm -hmm. and it's a human ace in the hole. Mm -hmm. Of course, I've got you know many, many, many PhDs in my company mm -hmm. developing credible mathematics to simulate real-world behaviors, mm -hmm. but it's the human aspect mm -hmm. that brings our company forward and really bonds us to our customers. How have we been able to replicate that in India, that vision? See, uh, MSC has a great brand value, mm -hmm. and since we actually do simulation, we're actually predicting uh, real-time behavior, yeah. and over a period of time, uh, these simulations are correlated with actual physical testing. Mm -hmm. So what happens is what, uh, when the correlation happens between the physical world and the virtual world, mm -hmm. then the, the brand of the software actually keeps getting better and better. So mm -hmm. over a period of time, people start eliminating some of the tests which they were doing earlier right. or Optimize. some of the new variation. Mm -hmm. So, th or, so being being around for 50 years has automatically kind of helped us. Mm -hmm. There is saying the results predicted by the MSC software mm -hmm. is kind of we can go ahead and start making tough decisions mm -hmm. based on the results predicted, so and that's kind of helped us. Trusting the results, trusting, trusting the results, yeah. you know, is is brand value. Mm -hmm. right? I trust the results, mm -hmm. and once you validate the results, you don't want to do it with someone else. It's yeah. just too expensive yeah. to do that. But you know, on a global scale, I can understand the big companies you're working with. Yes. But within within you know within the subcontinent, within India, um, I see a huge use of you know your kind of technologies for small and medium enterprises. Am I am I on the right track? But definitely. Actually, we first started off with our big guys. In the, some, in the automotive space, we actually see mm -hmm. it is the Tata Motors, Mahindra's, the Ashok Leyland, the Maruti Suzuki. Uh -huh. They are our largest customers. Mm -hmm. Similarly, in the aerospace, we have the uh, ADAs, the ADEs, the HALs of the world, mm -hmm. and then some of these multinational. 
companies who are setting up their R and D's in India, they are also big users of the software. Mm -hmm. Now the now, now the usage is percolating to the SME space mm -hmm. because these OEMs are actually wanting the suppliers to do more and more designs. Mm -hmm. Earlier, they were just treated like a yep. black box supplier. Mm -hmm. They do the design and the supplier just manufactures and gives it. That's right. Today, they're actually pushing them to do more and more design because they realize that they, they may have a better knowledge of a seeding system mm -hmm. than the OEM themselves. Okay. The supplier gets that intelligence as well. Right. So when you put the onus of the design on the supplier, uh -huh. then he has to do more and more simulation. So the simulation is actually percolating to the supplier level. That's like interestingly upsetting the Apple card because you're empowering more people to actually take control of a product rather than just the persons who are designing That's it. That's correct. But, but ultimately, it's the OEM. Uh, let me give you an example. Right. Uh, Airbus. Ultimately, yep. meeting the noise regulation standards you know, around airports and passenger comfort cabin you know they had a problem with the 380 on that one well you know it's interesting with the 380 our technology was used for simulating all the sound and then t eliminating sound mm -hmm. and now at the a380 the only problem is that the pilots are complaining mm -hmm. because when they go in the back of the plane to go to sleep mm -hmm. it's so quiet in the passenger cabin they can hear the chatting of people and it's a little <laughs> difficult to sleep so I, I declare you know that was a success <laughs> But tell me more, in India, how have you seen your product being used? Let's take some example in the aerospace area. Right. We had ADA, we played a very uh, crucial role uh -huh. in collaborating with them uh -huh. in the uh, design of the light combat aircraft. Right, pages, the LCA. Yep. The, the LCA. And uh, see, the LCA c carries different payloads. It mm -hmm. could be uh, air-to-air -air missile. Correct, air and they surface, have different variants as well. You have the naval variant, well. you have the land variant, yeah? So we need to ensure that uh, we simulate the different uh, variants and get it certified to fly. Mm -hmm. So we had a recent case study published by ADA. It was mm -hmm. in a public forum. Mm -hmm. That's how I'm able to talk about it, mm -hmm. where uh, MSC and ADA worked together mm -hmm. in getting the whole LCA certified to fly. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the key uh, success in the aerospace world. In the automotive world, uh, we have played a key role in uh, all the new products that are coming out. If you take the Mahindra, the latest SUV, which is XUV 500, yep. we actually played a role in Tata Motors, uh, mm -hmm. the Aria platform, mm -hmm. and uh, the Nano, and the previous Indica as well. So th we are definitely one of the key partners in the simulation space. Mm -hmm. And uh, we believe the products are actually kind of getting better mm -hmm. compared to what it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. They're actually kind of lighter, they can, they're kind of faster, and they're kind of more... Uh, um, they, they, they kind of, uh, they've got it right uh, pretty early, reduce the number of prototypes and, uh, and uh, MSC definitely played a key role in their success. I'd like to come back to aviation, Mr. Gallo. It seems like it's growing to be a big focus for you. Is it? Innovation. Aviation. A aviation. Actually, we started in the aviation market, so that was really the core of the company. Mm -hmm. Really, our first companies were in the aviation world, and some mm -hmm. of our largest customers in the world, mm -hmm. you know, from Boeing to Airbus to Lockheed Martin to Northrop Grumman to British Aerospace, uh, all of those guys have been our customers for many, many years. So what kind of challenges come to you from the aviation and the defense and the aerospace sector? I mean, what, how have you changed your thinking? What are you looking at developing for the big guys yeah. that will eventually help the smaller guys? You know, I think that, um, you know, first and foremost, their business challenges translate to our business opportunity. Yep. And the business challenge today, I'll, I'll give you one example. Mm -hmm. In Europe, there is a consortium called ACARE, and they have something called, you know, in 2050, all the goals. Mm -hmm. And so the goals are about cutting carbon emissions in airplanes 75%, nitrous okay. oxide 90%, cutting noise, mm -hmm. perceived noise 65%. So mm -hmm. okay. that's just huge challenges. Is, yeah. in, in fact, um, uh, maneuvering on the ground, mm -hmm. Uh, no carbon emission. That's the goal. Oh, okay. Right? So, you know, if you think about electric cars, you know, it'll be electric planes yeah. on the ground type of thing. So, those challenges that they have mm -hmm. translate into our opportunities, you know, to meet those challenges. Mm -hmm. And so, we're doing that in many, many ways. Fantastic. Uh, how's, that, how's, how's the work translating to India? What are the challenges within the Indian domain and how are you veering your innovation to meet these challenges here? Uh, let's take the automotive world. It's slightly different from the 
the rest of the world. Right. In India, if you take a car, durability becomes a major focus area. Mm -hmm. People want to use their cars for five years, seven years, unlike the European market where they kind of replace the cars every couple of, couple of years. Yeah, yeah. And the fuel efficiency is a much bigger focus area. And crash is not a big focus area in the Indian market scenario. Yet, so yeah. some of the design constraints and the design specifications mm -hmm. in India are pretty different compared, mm -hmm. to, compared to the vehicles that European standards uh, determine. So, and uh, frugal engineering is a very, very yep. big uh, word in India. How do I develop better cars uh, uh -huh. at a lower cost? And that becomes one of the basic constraints uh, in, the, in the human mind. We recently had a meeting with Tata Motors this morning where he's saying, what he, where he was saying is, can I make a single platform to meet the Indian standards and the European standards mm -hmm. for, to, for to export the vehicles? And right. he said that by doing this, we are making the vehicles more and more complex right. because, the design, because the specifications are so different between these two markets. Right. The BS4 is radically different from what Europe demands at this point of time. Speaking about MSE and India, has, has the company delivered the promise of giving Indian talent and Indian, you know, Indian research and development? How do you perceive how the India Center has grown? I mean, from a global perspective and from a yeah. local perspective? Yeah, well, has it delivered? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And we think of it as, it's really kind of interesting. Um, although our India Development Center actually is responsible for complete product mm -hmm. in some cases, but the truth is, we don't actually have a center in the world mm -hmm. that actually delivers a complete product because, you know, talents are so different. Mm -hmm. You go, because this is very specialized, so you go to our, our centers around the world, mm -hmm. right? It, it could be in, in um, you know, we have centers in the Netherlands, we have centers in, in Belgium, obviously in California and mm -hmm. Michigan, those types of things. So um, they're no different from any one of our centers, you know, what we do here, mm. and they're completely integrated in. And we measure very carefully the productivity and the innovation of all of our centers. And, you know, and I would say we're at this really great development platform level that everyone contributes almost at an equal weight. So it's really great. Fantastic. So it's been fantastic, actually. And there has been some products which are actually being designed, built, tested in India as well. Yeah. Some okay. of the new products that we have come out today mm -hmm. are completely uh, designed and developed in India. You know, you know, when you talk to customers, it usually get a fantastic different perspective of what you, you, you envisage a certain product and you assume that this is what my customer might need. But when you actually sit and talk to the customer, you'll probably get a complete 180 degree points of view. But tell me how you've had to recalibrate yourselves, especially after you have met Indian customers. Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting because there's... Um, Generally speaking, I spend almost all my time in mm -hmm. front of customers, yep. right? So at night, mm -hmm. I actually run the business, okay. but during the daytime. And what customers will tell you is, from where they are, mm -hmm. what's the next level they want to be? Mm -hmm. What I spend my time is what I call anthropology. Okay. I really watch their workflows and right. what they're doing. Because what a customer can almost never tell you is how dramatic innovation could be done. Mm -hmm. They can give you their workflows, mm -hmm. and then you can actually deduce that. But in terms of you know the next step and where you're going, mm -hmm. I would say Indian customers are no different. I mean, actually, the, the rate of change is pretty dramatic here. We have customers that three years ago they had 10 engineers doing simulation. Mm -hmm. um, and they weren't going to increase that by 27% or 30%, mm -hmm. but in one year, 100%. But I think, generally speaking, you know, the Indian um, simulation development engineers are at a very high level now on a world standard. Wasn't the case three years ago or five years ago, certainly, uh -huh. but very high level. How have you been interacting with the academic institutions? Because one of the biggest uses of software like this, apart from the industry, sure. is, is really catching them young and watching them grow, helping them understand how you know, 10 man hours can be cut down and it can be a five minute activity for all practical purposes. So how has the response been from the academic front? Yeah, oh, we have uh, products uh, highly subsidized for the education industry, mm -hmm. where they can actually kind of uh, use the product to teach simulation mm -hmm. using our tools to their industry. Mm -hmm. And we have more than uh, 400 engineering colleges who are actually kind of uh, okay. uh, using our tools to teach uh, simulation. Mm -hmm. But one thing what we did pretty recently, thanks to Dominic's initiative was, we allowed students 
to freely download this download our software okay. for for their use that okay. they can actually kind of learn it during the, in their home or during their yeah. free time so we had about 3000 people mm -hmm. 3000 students who actually downloaded our software till now mm -hmm. and we are also kind of promoting certification right. so that they can actually kind of uh, write a test uh, on our website and we kind of give them certification and that can actually increase their employability as well. Fantastic. So people, students are able to kind of... Uh, and what are these What are these kind of certifications that we're talking about? Like for example, we have different domains. For example, right. in the simulation space, we have an NVH domain, mm -hmm. a structures domain, mm -hmm. and we have a ride and handling or a motion, motion domain. Right. So we have certification for the structures people, mm -hmm. which are different kind of engineers who actually kind of uh, working in the structure space mm -hmm. and then we have engineers working on the motion space. So if people get certified in one of these two domains, they can actually kind of go and apply for jobs in these domains uh, in our in our customer base. You're talking about students and the kind of demands that they have, Mr. Galello, how has how has the smartphone or you know the kind of technologies that we're living today, how has it impacted your business or how have you had to recalibrate and look at a different direction if you have had to? Running simulation on a pad or a smartphone is not is not the story for us, but the story is that simulation, as you know, again, it's a it's a 50 year old industry, mm -hmm. um, very complicated, hard to use, and those types of things. And the society today mm. is, I just learn by doing, right. right? Learn by trial and error, learn by experiment. Forget about courses, forget about books. So I always like to say, my goal is to have zero revenue from training, zero, right? okay. because your products have to be self-absorbing. Yep. And, um, and so what I always try to do, this is the last time in my career that I can do it, uh, you know, we're developing a next generation environment that uh, really I like to target my kids, you know, mm -hmm. so my mechanical engineering student's son, mm -hmm. right, you know, if, it has to be a product that he can use. Mm -hmm. And so he is a product of, he didn't learn computers, mm -hmm. right? He is of computers. Mm -hmm. And so simulation software has to be exactly the same. Okay. Um, in terms of the impact that you see your technology is making, how do you see it being disruptive over the next couple of decades? Yeah, well, I think the disruptive part of it is that the whole engineering, right, design, and test mm -hmm. and build process, mm -hmm. right? The test and build process mm -hmm. is very expensive yep. and it's very time consuming. Yep. And of course, everyone is trying to first time quality and get it right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think the disruptive part of it is taking out a dramatic part of the testing cycle. So one of the things that is actually the case is new materials, right? Everyone right. is lightweight, you know, a catchphrase in automotive or aerospace is lightweight, taking weight out. But of course, if you take weight out, then safety becomes a big issue. And so new materials is causing an explosion in physical testing. I know you spoke about automobiles a couple of times out here, but you know, the Indian automobile market is genuinely facing perhaps its toughest times over the past few years. How do you see, how, how are you viewing the automobile sector? I mean, um, as Dominic said, uh, when the situation gets tougher, it's a big opportunity for the simulation space. Right. Okay. And this is a the time they can't afford to make more prototypes. <laughs> this is a time they can't <laughs> afford to make more testing. So they have to rely on virtual world. They have to rely on virtual simulation. Mm -hmm. And I believe this is an opportunity for us to kind of engage with them, partner with them much more and work with them in their future platforms mm -hmm. so that they can actually get confidence. Like there, we have some of the OEMs mm -hmm. who are maybe today 30% uh, digital and 70% physical, mm -hmm. but the vision of the, uh, the CEO is to be 70% digital and 30% physical. Mm -hmm. And that's a kind of a great opportunity that we really have. Mm -hmm. So I believe that the more the difficult times today is a great opportunity for the simulation companies like us. Fantastic. All the very best to you, gentlemen, and it was fantastic having you join us here on Bloomberg Television India. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.